Atheist Nomads, episode 101. It all fits together with Danielle Moscato. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Howdy ho, neighbor. And joining us is Danielle Moscato. Danielle, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thanks for having me on. And Danielle is a blogger and public speaker, um, formerly with American Atheists as a public relations director and all around awesome person. So we're, we're happy to have you. Well, I, I'm happy to be here. Thanks really much for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's all right. You don't have to say that you've ever heard of us before. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually talked once before when uh, it was our turn helping out on uh, the secular.fm uh, streamathon. Yeah, I was oh, going to yeah. say. I, I think I have. I've either. I don't think I've been on this show, but I know that I've talked to you guys before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, awesome. So, tell us about your life. Yeah, well, I I just moved back to Missouri. Um, this is where I was uh, born and raised. I've, I've lived a couple of other places. I lived in Philadelphia for a little while, and then I lived the last three years in New Jersey. Um, but it's it's nice out here. It's it's different. It's a smaller town, hundred thousand people. It's a college town. Um, fairly liberal for, for what you think of when you think of Missouri, uh, just, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, the university of Missouri is here and a, a, a large ratio of the population has higher education degrees and graduate degrees. And, uh, but you know, you go 20 miles in any direction and, and it's very conservative, uh, lots of, yeah. lots of conservative talk radio and stuff, but I totally uh, get what you're saying there. I live in Boise, Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. Boise is that way also. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's a uh, it's it's okay. Um, we uh, proud to have marriage equality now. We had marriage equality in St. Louis last year. Um, I actually uh, when that when St. Louis County uh, there was a judge there, a district judge who struck down the uh, the ban. Uh, there's a, a state constitutional ban on, on marriage equality in Missouri. There was, um, and that was struck down in St. Louis County. And uh, the city of St. Louis was issuing marriage licenses and the rest of the county of St. Louis uh, said that they were going to follow suit with whatever St. Louis, the city was doing. Uh, and I last year, I flew back to Missouri uh, to do some weddings um, the, the day that that happened. Um, but, yeah, now now it's not just statewide, but nationwide. And it's it's really wonderful. <laughs> so badass, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Uh we just we just went to uh, Seattle Pride out here, and the parade. It's usually like I don't know three ish hours. Yesterday was over five, and then yeah. Pride Fest after that. It was just freaking amazing. Everybody was out, and great. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. Though. In in the years that I lived in New Jersey, uh, you know, I got to New York quite regularly. I was I was 29 minutes away from Midtown Manhattan by train. Mm -hmm. And um, on the weekends that I wasn't traveling for work, I would very often go into the city. And it just so happened, uh, I never actually got a chance to go to Pride in New York City the entire time I was there. And I was planning to go this year, but then uh, I ended up in Missouri. And of course, this happened, so I, I missed the big one. But I was in New York <laughs> State. Uh, I was in Buffalo when New York got marriage equality. So that was a lot of fun, too. Awesome. So badass. Yeah. We had Pride here in Boise uh, the weekend before and then uh, had a rally Friday on the Capitol steps that was pretty awesome. 
uh, nice Great. celebratory rally. And at the uh, actual uh, Pride Festival, there was actually two of the women who were plaintiffs in the lawsuit that brought marriage equality to Idaho spoke. Oh, great. And they had some of their other plaintiffs and uh, one of their lawyers with them. So that was really awesome. Really fun. A friend of mine on Facebook uh, posted a picture with uh, Jim Obergefell today. And I was just like, that's so cool. I <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. yeah, that was a, well, it was a compilation, I guess, of a, of a couple of cases that they, you know, for, for that, but that was the one that everybody's going to remember. So. Yeah, yeah, they lumped in four cases together. Yeah. Everything from one district. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the early days. Uh, you were actually from Missouri, though. Yeah, yeah. I was born and raised here. Um, so uh, my parents are are from the East Coast. My mom is from Philadelphia. My dad is from upstate New York, um, and they both went to their uh, clinical oncologists, uh, you know, cancer doctors mm. that, that do cancer, and they also do cancer research. And I, I grew up in a, in a household that was, that was very science minded, that had a, a good emphasis on critical thinking and, and, you know, avoiding woo and understanding that that is not productive. Um, my parents are, are kind of sort of religious, not really. Like I would say that they're kind of agnostic leaning deists, uh, my mom is Jewish, but I don't think she really practices Judaism. Like she goes to temple twice a year and uh, I, she does the Jewish prayers, but I don't think that she actually thinks that like that does anything. I think it's just, you know, when you're lighting the menorah for Hanukkah, you, there's like things that you say when you do it, it's a ritual. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, my dad is, is slightly more religious, but not really. He's Roman Catholic, but he's like, the kind of Roman Catholic that gives money to Planned Parenthood, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, that's great. I give money to Planned Parenthood too, you know? Um, but, uh, but he went to, to Catholic school growing up and, you know, he's, he's a little bit more involved with that. Um, he goes to mass every once in a while uh, with his mother. Um, Cause she now lives in Missouri. Also, she's a uh, hundred years old now. Um, wow. She likes to, she likes to do that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't really raised really religious. I, I, I believed in God growing up, but I don't, I never like was very involved in any particular religion, uh, mm-hmm. until I was 20. Uh, I got quite serious about Christianity. I started, and, and it was kind of, uh, I, it wasn't really on purpose. I was a, a musician. Um, I dropped out of high school and played music for a number of years and, I got a, a gig playing at a church and it was a fill in gig. It was just, they needed a bass player and I, I was available and I did it and uh, they really liked me and I liked them and it was steady money and it was easy. Uh, and the music was kind of fun. I mean, for that kind of music, you know, it's, it's rock music. It's, it's, it's not my favorite kind of stuff to play, but um, it sure beats, you know, country music, which is the only other kind of music to play around here. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Missouri. They have both kinds of music, country and Western. That's right. Um, no, I mean, there's, you know, there's other stuff that you can play around here, especially in, in Columbia, because like I said, you know, it's a college town. But if you want to make money uh, in, in Columbia as a musician, if you want to support yourself, you're going to, I mean, you're going to be playing religious music. That's just kind of how it is. It's going to be part of your income or all of your income. And, uh, and you know, it's, it was, it was easy to fall into that because, you know, playing at bars and stuff, you, you get ripped off a lot. You get your gear stolen. People spill beer on your stuff. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you get off work at four in the morning and it's, um, it's not a very nice way to make a living. It's, it's fun in its way. But if you want to play music professionally and you are sick of dealing with junkies and drunks and, you know, and, and just that in the bar scene um, and you want to, and you want to actually make a living playing music around here, your options are become a, a teacher, you know, a guitar teacher or, or a professor at the, at the university or something um, work in the public schools, you know, like as a band leader or play at a church. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what there is around here as far as steady jobs doing that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I fell into that and, it was nice. The, the people were very, very kind and welcoming and you know how evangelical Christians are to people who are not gay and white. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just being frank, you know, that's, um, they, they have a way of sucking you in 
and and killing you with kindness and uh and and you don't realize how i don't know if i'm allowed to say this how screwed up i was going to say a different word oh, bel- trust me yeah you can totally say it. adult you can say whatever the fuck you want you have, okay you have a way they have a way of of not letting you into the real fucked up crazy until you're already kind of sucked into it you know mm-hmm. so you start out uh they're they're very nice to you they seem really genuine they seem a lot less stuck up and a lot less uh, nutty than you might have thought, you know, they, they're normal people. Um, and then once you join and once you've been playing with them for a while, then they start to let on that the earth is 6,000 years old and they start <laughs> to let on that any sex outside of marriage is a terrible, terrible sin unless it's anal. And then that's okay, but we don't talk about it. And <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, and, and, uh, you know, drugs are absolutely bad and, and the, your body is a temple. You're not supposed to do that, um, you know, but it's okay as long as we don't talk about it. <laughs> it's like they're, they're musicians, you know, I mean, come on, they're having sex, they're doing drugs. It's just when they're on stage, they have this persona of being very pure. And it's the whole thing is it's a, it's, it's a lie. I mean, it is, the whole thing is a lie. It's, it's not just the fact that they don't tell their congregations the fact that the Bible is man-made and, uh, and, you know, and, and that side of the scam, but the whole thing is just double faced. And when they get caught with something that they can't hide, uh, you know, adultery or, or whatever, they just chalk it up to just being uh, human and just say that, you know, we're all born in sin and, and that's why we need Jesus to forgive us. And, and it's just like, come on, you're this, this is all this extra layer of nonsense that you're just making up. It's, you know, people do human things and that's just the way it is. And it's not, you're not better. You don't need forgiveness. You just, I mean, you do from, you know, your spouse, if that was what happened, but like, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with being human. And, and anyway, so just getting back to my background, I kind of got off on a tangent there. Um, Yeah. So I started working for this church. I started playing with them. I did that for five years and, I got the uh, kind of feeling that if I was, if I was actually going to do this for my career, if I was going to take it seriously, that I should read the Bible and I should do it right. Because I'd never done that before. I I didn't grow up Christian. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I read the NIV, which was the one that my church used. um, And I read it as a Christian and I, and I absorbed every little bit of it. Um, a friend of mine told me that the King James is the more authoritative, you know, quote unquote version. So I read the King James and then I realized that this was kind of a silly approach because there are so many English translations. I mean, there are dozens of English mm-hmm. translations, not counting oh, yeah. literal ones and so on and, and the study ones, but just, just regular ones. And I thought this is stupid. I, there's, if I really want to understand what Jesus taught, if I really want to understand what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to live as a Christian, the right way to do this is to read the original documents and, and to actually learn this and do it right. So I found a classics grad student at the university of Missouri uh, who tutored me twice a week in Greek and Latin. And I wanted to read the original documents and I found out pretty quickly that you can't because we don't have them. Um, <laughs> we have, you know, copies of copies of translations of this stuff. It's very historically unreliable. Um, and the more you read, the more you realize it's completely made up. And that, that really, you know, in a, in a, in a maybe a six month to a year span just destroyed my ability to have uh, any faith that Christianity was, was historically accurate, which was important to me is, is, you know, valuing truth about this kind of stuff. Uh, it made it impossible for me to continue to be a Christian at that point. I still believe in God, but um, but the, when, when people ask me, like, what's the best argument against Christianity or against religion, you can't, there's no answer to that. There's no one answer. It depends on why someone believes. For me, I believed because I thought it was accurate, actually historically accurate. That's what mm-hmm. I thought. And uh, because that's what I was told that when I read the books, I thought that these were written by witnesses and that they were right. And once I actually read a little bit more about who wrote them and when I started reading uh, it's called like a horizontal reading as opposed to vertical reading. So usually when you read a book, you know, you start the first line on the first page and you read until the last line on the last page and you just read vertically reading horizontally. 
uh, refers to when you have multiple accounts of the same story, and instead of reading them beginning to end one after the other, you compare the same account across one telling versus another author versus another mm-hmm. author, and then you compare them. And when you do that, you instantly realize there are major, major contradictions in these different accounts that cannot be reconciled that you would not necessarily notice if you're reading them beginning to end and not comparing them side mm-hmm. to side. Oh, yeah. And when I, the, the minor one is just the how many times did, did Peter deny Christ? Because if you compare them, yeah, there's at least five. Yeah, I think the, the, the one that really sealed it for me, that, was, that made me realize that this is not just made up, but made up on purpose, that it's not just a mistake, but that they were trying to do something by changing it, uh, is the fact that the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, all tell the story of Jesus dying on, uh, on Passover. And John changes it. On purpose, he changed it so that Jesus died on the day of the preparation of Passover, which is the day before Passover. So, of course, in in Judaism, you know, the day begins at sunset. So that's that's the beginning of the day. So when you say the day of preparation, what you really mean is the morning of the night of Passover. So the reason that that's very significant in theologically, I should say, is that John has this idea that Jesus is the lamb. He calls him the lamb. I mean, he uses that word. Uh, he, he has this idea of, of what's called a substitutionary atonement, which is very important to Christianity, that Jesus died for your sins, that uh, instead of sacrificing animals uh, you know, to, to repay God for our sins, um, which is what Jews do, Jesus died as the lamb, as the sacrificial lamb. And, and because he did that, now we can stop with all these Jewish rituals of sacrificing animals and we can thank Jesus for doing it instead. That whole idea of substitutionary atonement only exists in the Gospel of John. And the reason that it, it's important to the story is specifically that he changed the day that this happens. Jews uh, on Passover, remember the day the preparation is, you know, the afternoon of Passover uh, before the meal they would go to the temple, they would bring their money, they would exchange it for temple money, they would buy an animal, a lamb or whatever, they would give it to the priests, the priests would slaughter it and keep the best parts and that's how they ate, and then they would give the re- the rest of it to the Jewish people, the Jewish people would take it home and they would make their Passover dinner, and that's that's how they did it. So by having Jesus die on the day of preparation, John was actually trying to communicate something. I mean, he was making a theological point. It's not just that he changed what day Jesus died from the, from the earlier chronologically written accounts of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, because it was a difference. He changed it because he was saying Jesus is the lamb. He was saying by, by having Jesus die on the day of preparation, I am, I am communicating that theologically, this is an important point that Jesus is, uh, is the substitution for these animals. And when I realized this isn't just a contradiction, John changed the story to tell us something. Then I was like, well, what else has changed to make a point? And that's when all this, because I, I also studied um, Roman history and a lot, of, a lot of other things having to do with Latin literature. And this was a, this was a very common occurrence in, in the way that Romans wrote stories. Um, it's kind of uh, the, the best example, I think, to understand how they, how they appreciated history uh, and how they talked about history is like telling a joke. It's kind of like how if I say, like, well, this guy goes to the, the airport and he's trying to smuggle coffee beans from Colombia into the United States and he gets stopped at customs and customs says, what's all this? And he goes, it's birdseed. And they say, it really looks like coffee beans. And he says, well, it's birdseed. If you know, that's what you give the birds, they'll eat it. It's like, that's, <laughs> that's a terrible telling of a joke. It's not funny. But if you tell it right, it's a funnier joke. It's a better joke, you know? And the way that Romans did history, they didn't actually try to get it like perfectly historically accurate details. They tried to tell a good story and they tried to make a point and it wasn't considered being a bad historian to change stuff the way it is now. Like we consider if a historian changes details, we're like, you're a bad historian. You, uh. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to get it as absolutely accurate as possible without changing anything and be as thorough as you can. That's not the way that Romans approached the, the social science of history. Romans approached it by, by having a good story 
And it was not considered bad to change details if it made the story better. And that's not completely, completely true. I mean, when you're talking about like, like demographic surveys and tax records and stuff, obviously that doesn't apply. But when you're talking about uh, storytelling and, and mythology, that was a very much, that was a much more important and foundational part of Roman culture than it is now, the, the mythology. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Once I put that together with the Bible, then I realized there's telling stories. This is not supposed to be true. And that's okay. In fact, that makes it better. uh, Understanding that these stories have significance to Christianity, but they're not actually true. And at that point I was like, I can't call myself a Christian anymore. Um, And the way that I, I moved from God believing non-Christian to atheist is by studying kind of expanding circles away from fields related to the social science of history uh, and and Roman mythology. I started studying epistemology. I started studying cultural anthropology. uh, And once I kind of understood not just that the Romans were making up details, but that ancient peoples made up stories generally about science type topics because they didn't have better answers to these things because they wanted to understand the world around them and they didn't have the proper scientific tools to measure what was going on and to explain it scientifically that humans are curious animals and that we, we don't like not knowing how things work. We don't like not having answers. We, we enjoy mysteries, but just as, as a, as a people, we like having stories that tell what's going on in, in, in some cases we don't even care if they're like actually true or not, if they're entertaining and sure. Yeah, and every culture does this, and that's okay. That's part of what makes us human, and that's what makes us interesting, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, one of my majors, when I after I, I left the church and I ended up going to college, because uh, I, I dropped out of high school, and when I was no longer a working Christian musician, I went to college. Uh, I studied anthropology, because this was really fascinating to me, um, how, how cultures make up these kinds of stories, and how cultures explain things that they don't have good explanation for that we now have good explanations for, but we didn't thousands of years ago or, or even 500 years ago before, you know, the enlightenment. Um, and I, I think it's fascinating. I, I don't, I don't hold it against ancient cultures for making this stuff up. That's just, that's what they did. And it's, it's interesting, but we should know better now. I mean, we should understand it for what it is and what it is, is a story. It's not true. Uh, it communicates something culturally important, but not factual. And- well, I mean, yeah, you totally can't fault them. Right? I mean, if they didn't have the tools to to know better, then you know they had to explain it somehow. And right, yeah, you know, people just don't like to have no answer at all. Yeah, and and I mean, it's it's okay. Well, have have interesting stuff. story. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I think this is this is how progress is made. Is how you know coming up with some explanation. And and then re- and then testing it and then realizing it was wrong and then trying to refine your explanation. I mean that's what science is, uh, more or less. But yeah, so so um, just as far as getting back to my you know my story uh, to answer the question, um, yeah. So so after I enrolled in college, um, I went, when I was no longer with the church as a, as a musician, uh, I joined a, a secular band and and just played cover songs and you know. Um, it, it it wasn't a full time thing, but it it helped with money, and uh, and I went to college and I studied. I actually studied uh, economics and anthropology, and I minored in philosophy and Latin. Although I never graduated, and uh, what I was interested in is uh, cultural anthropology, like I mentioned about how cultures come up with this kind of stuff. But also uh, in economics, I was very interested in game theory and especially the evolution of cooperation. Um, in in animals that are social animals. Uh, I was very interested in this idea of uh, if there's no God, how do we know what's moral? How, how did this types of ideas that seem to be quite universal or close, um, where do they come from? That murder is wrong, that rape is wrong, that, uh, that 
self-sacrifice is good. Like where did the, where does that all come from if it's not a God coming up with it? And we see this in, in many species. This isn't just humans that do this. Um, you know, piranhas don't attack each other. Uh, sharks do, but that's another story. But like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I was very interested in like how do lions know how to work together to, to hunt? Uh, I mean, obviously it's in their self-interest because they can take down bigger game if they work together. But how did that happen? Like how did they start working together to do that um, you know, coming from, from organisms that, that might not have done that, you know, evolutionarily much, much before that time. And, uh, yeah, so I studied, uh, game theory and, and the evolution of cooperation. And, uh, there's a lot of really fascinating books on this stuff. Um, just as a quick side note, if you're interested in that topic, my favorite book about this, uh, one of my favorite books generally, actually, is called The Origins of Virtue by Matt Ridley. Uh, it's an amazing book that just very clearly explains um, where morality came from as, as an evolutionary thing. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, but while I was in school, I got involved with uh, the Hi. University of Missouri's uh, SSA group. It's called Sasha, uh, Skeptics, Atheists, Secular Humanists, and Agnostics. Um, and Sasha was very, very new when I joined. There were five of us in the group. Um, they didn't have a blog. They didn't have a Facebook page. They didn't have a Twitter feed. Um, they had weekly meetings, but uh, yeah, I mean, there were five of us. We, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't much there. Um, and uh, I had a lot of experience with uh, promotion and public relations and uh, booking events and things like that uh, and being on stage just from, from playing music and from being a music promoter. So uh, I, I joined and then I became the director of public relations for Sasha. And we had our first conference. We brought in Nate Phelps as the keynote and Del nice. Ray as, as the other keynote on the second night. Um, and yeah, we had a, a bunch of professors come and speak and we called it Sasha Khan. It's still going on. They, they're still doing it uh, nice. every year. Um, but yeah, the way that, that I got involved with that, I basically, uh, I, I had studied all of this stuff on my own the last year and a half, last two years, uh, in the process of becoming an atheist about the history of Christianity, about the history of the New Testament formation, uh, about morality and the development of all this stuff in animals, um, all sorts of related topics. Uh, I studied a lot of ethics. I studied a lot of um, epistemology, just things that were interesting to me in, in my journey and becoming an atheist. So I took that information that I had and I started writing talks about it. I wrote uh, about 15 one hour talks that I started giving every week to our group and uh, just, you know, for us to have something to do at our meetings. And um, at, at, at one point I was like, you know, I have all these talks written. My group has already heard them. Uh, there are other SSA groups nearby. I wonder if they would want me to give talks to their group. And I had a car. So I started getting in touch with other SSA groups. I went to the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg, Missouri. I went to SOMA in Lawrence, Kansas, which is the University yeah. of Kansas group. Yeah, they're great. I went to um, Wolf in uh, Wash U in St. Louis and, you know, in various other groups around here. Um, and started giving talks and, and kind of getting reputation as somebody who does that. That led to getting asked to speak at, uh, at uh, Reason Fest, which is SOMA's annual conference in Lawrence, Kansas, at the University of Kansas. Uh, that led to Greg Epstein, uh, who works for the humanist community at Harvard. He's the, the Harvard uh, humanist chaplain. Uh, he saw me speak because he was one of the speakers at that con as well. And he invited me to start blogging for the humanist community at Harvard, uh, which was my first kind of official, you know, real entrance into the world of professional activism. So I started yes. blogging for them, um, uh, for Greg, uh, for that blog. Uh, and I started a blog for Sasha um, at musasha.org. Um, and that led to getting asked to apply for a summer internship at the National Secular Student Alliance in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which I, I was accepted for. And I did that for a summer for, for 10 weeks. I lived in Ohio and, and was an intern for the SSA. And while I was there, I co-wrote the fourth edition of the group running guide, which is um, if you start an SSA chapter, uh, an affiliate, they will send you this packet, uh, you know, to start up your group. And, uh, the main thing that it comes with is this book that's an A to Z guide to everything about starting and running an SSA group all the way 
from choosing a name, getting recognized by your school through putting on a multi-speaker, multi-day conference. Everything is in there. Um, and oh, um, yeah, so, so I co-wrote that with uh, Ellen Lundgren um, while, while we were the interns at SSA. And uh, then uh, after that, uh, that led to an invitation to apply for the public relations director position at American Atheists. And even though I wasn't done with school, I was a junior at this point. Um, I mean, I was, I was 28, but you know, I, I hadn't graduated. Uh, I, uh, I applied for that and I, I was hired. So I moved to New Jersey uh, without graduating and started working for American Atheists, which is what I've been doing for the past two and a half years. Um, and yeah, you know, that, that very recently we parted ways and, I love American Atheists. I'm a life member. I, I adore that organization, and I always will. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we had talked a little bit offline before we started the podcast about um, my leaving American Atheists, and I, it was on very good terms. Um, but uh, American Atheists has changed its uh, activism approach, um, and as a result of changing its kind of mission and, and activities, uh, has also changed some of its, its staff lineup. Um, so mm-hmm. they don't require a public relations director anymore. And so I, I no longer work there. Um, yeah, they, they let go uh, a, quite a quite a few people, um, but they're going to be focusing. And I'm actually excited about this because, I mean, it, it's unfortunate for me because I liked my job and I liked what I was doing. <laughs> but as far as the movement, I think this is a good thing in that uh, they're going to be focusing a little bit less on media attention, a little bit less on, on education and outreach to the public. Um, mm-hmm and more on things like uh, lawsuits and things like uh, public policy uh, and things like lobbying. Um, it's, nice. They actually uh, have just opened an office now in D.C. that Amanda Kniff is, is relocating. Uh, she was the managing director before, and now she's in charge of their legal stuff and, and lobbying, and she's going to be working out of Washington, D.C. now uh, to be a, a more direct uh, in. Uh, uh, voice for atheism, activism um, to politicians. And I think that that's very much what we need. We need, we need people on the ground who are educated about this stuff. Amanda's a lawyer and she has legislation experience and she has lobbying experience. She used to work for SCA and before that the Iowa legislature drafting bills. Uh, but uh, we, I mean, politics is where this is happening. I mean, the, the public perception of atheists is very important and will continue to be important in reducing the stigma of being an atheist and out atheist. That's, that's important work. But what really matters in the big picture is the law. If, if we have bills that allow discrimination or that don't outlaw discrimination, it's going to continue to be a problem. And you can, you can have all the public support in the world, but if the, if you have, a theocracy, it doesn't matter. We have to make sure that our laws are secular laws, that the justifications for our laws are not rooted in religion. All, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not just separation of church and state when it comes to Ten Commandments monuments on, on courthouse lawns and stuff. Not that that isn't symbolically important, but you know, it is a matter of equality, it is a matter of equal access and so on. But if we're talking about abortion access, if we're talking about sex ed in public schools, if we're talking about birth control and insurance coverage, if we're talking about uh, environmentalism, even, uh, I mean, these are all at their core religion issues. These are separation of church and state issues. I mean, the only reason that we have any kind of debate about abortion is because of the Christian idea that souls exist, which is ridiculous and false, Mm -hmm. but this would not be an issue. I mean, there, there is there exists arguably an ethical argument for why abortion might be wrong. You know, I mean, I, I could see being able to argue that without, without using religion. In fact, there's even a group, there's a, a secular pro-life group that does that. Um, I disagree with that. I'm, I'm extremely pro-choice. I donate money to Planned Parenthood, as I mentioned before, but um, this, this idea that, that sex is shameful, that masturbation is shameful, that, uh, homosexuality is wrong. 
um, and that you know sex is only for procreation within married couples, and that abortion is is evil. All of that comes straight from Christianity. I mean, that's it's puritanical Christian influence on American politics, which is against the law. It's unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that we're still talking about this forty years after Roe v. Wade is because of Christian influence. It's stupid. It's unconstitutional, and and this is this needs to stop. Um, and that's where atheists come in. This is where we say, look. We have a constitution that protects separation of religion and government. We we need to stop fighting about this. We have other things that we need to focus on. We already settled this. Uh, mm-hmm. If you don't want an abortion because you're religious and it's against your religion, then don't fucking get one. That's fine. Don't. But don't stop other people from getting one because that's not your place. Um, so that's the kind of thing that they're working on. Um, I had mentioned – uh, birth control access. Again, I mean, Hobby Lobby, that was the entire basis of it was their religious subjection to they, they had this, this sincerely held religious belief about a scientific falsehood. Like, mm-hmm. the, the whole thing, it's just it's so absurd. Their, their argument was that birth control, they believe for religious reasons, causes abortions. It, I, first of all, it doesn't. But second of all, even if you believe that it does, it's not your place as an employer to deny birth control coverage to your employees on the basis of your religion. And that was what the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case was all about. Well, in so, Hobby Lobby's well, case, it was a couple of specific drugs they took objection to, right. um, in particular P- Plan B, mm-hmm. despite the right. fact that their 401k is heavily invested in the production yeah. of actual abortion drugs. Right. Right. And, and, and I mean, when you're talking yeah. about 401ks, I mean, it's an index fund. So it's, they, they don't even directly control or, or even really indirectly control. I Same mean, as insurance. Into, yeah, yeah. I mean, you buy into a fund <laughs> and the fund invests where it thinks it's going to get a return and you don't even necessarily see or have any, any way to, I mean, you could, you could ask them for a list of companies they're investing in, but you don't have, I mean, when you, when you buy an index fund, you don't know what companies are investing in normally and you don't know what, uh, what products those companies make or, or are doing in research and development. You just know, you, you, you tell your broker, this is the amount of risk that I'm willing to take on. And this is the, the return on investment that I want. Uh, and this is how much I want to invest. And they, they take it from there, you know, which um, is actually yeah. pretty close to how corporations mm-hmm. and insurance typically works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, the, the birth control thing, I mean, again, it's plan B, it's this is very clearly known and and talked about in the literature like when you buy plan b in the in the fine print it tells you this if you are pregnant it won't work it doesn't actually cause abortions uh it's it's not what's it called um are are you 86 or something are you 486 yeah yes i i was thinking no that's the computer a 486 but no that's actually the filter uh yeah i mean there is a pill that can do that. That if it's a you know it's a chemical abortion as opposed to a surgical one. But there are pills that do that, like you mentioned that they invest in. But uh, birth control is not that. It's that's not how that works. And and even Plan B is not that and won't do that. Um, but yeah, I mean again, this is a religious argument. This is religion trying to butt its way into politics and and control other people's lives besides the lives of the people voluntarily being religious. And that's that's not right. We have separation of church and state. We have freedom of religion. If you don't want to practice someone else's religion, you are not required to. And and that's it. That's the basis of it. Um, first, you know, I mean, first line of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. I mean, that's that's the very first thing that James Madison put in there. It was freedom mm-hmm. of religion. Um, well, and, if, if they're yeah. going to protest anything, they should be person protesting their own God, who is the biggest ab- abortion doctor out there. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, and I mean, even, even if you don't believe the Bible accounts of all that stuff, which, you know, if, if you're coherent, you shouldn't, but, <laughs> uh, but he, I mean, even just on a more practical front, if you're anti-abortion, you should be pro sex ed and pro birth control. Right. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that reduce the number of abortions. And I understand not compromising your principles. If you want to say like, well, you know, I think that abortions are wrong. And I also think that uh, birth control is wrong. And or, or I mean, um, progressive uh, sex positive sex ed. You know, if I can understand saying I'm not going to, to compromise on sex ed in order to reduce the number of abortions, even though the data shows that that will work. But Come on, wake up! I, I can I can totally see them abortion. saying, you know, yeah, abortion's bad, uh, condoms are bad, mm-hmm. but comprehensive sex ed—I mean, that that just all around 
it complete that that will help what they're trying to do. I mean, right. and keep there's a way from, to do that that's religiously, you know, okay. I was went to Adventist schools and had comprehensive sex ed that was all under the guise of here's what's going to happen on your wedding night and here's how to make sure you don't have a baby until you're ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that does conflict. If your if your idea of sex is that it's it's made by God for the purpose of procreation, then that is going to go to your religion. But sorry, that's your religion doesn't get a say in <laughs> in public school sex ed. It it mm-hmm. just doesn't. Uh, if you want to teach your kids something unscientific or or false, um, you're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to tell teachers that they can't teach other kids or, or frankly, teach your kid in a public school uh, correct information. If you don't want your kid learning that stuff, then take them out of public school, put them in a private school or homeschool them and teach them whatever you want. Um, yeah, they need to go to private school or homeschool because yeah. it, it, one, every student should get the same cur- curriculum if they go to a public school. And and not just the same, but but a scientific evidence-based curricula. I mean, that's yeah, definitely. The, that's the, yeah. Having gone to a private school, uh, I think all schools should have to follow the same curriculum period. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, the, yeah, this, this idea that local school boards are set curricula is a bad idea, I think. Um, and oh, there's the yeah. whole, I mean, yeah. that's a whole other mess, uh, especially talking about um, like the fact that very religious people can, can influence that a lot. Uh, not for the public good, but for advancing their own ideas. Um, that's a that's a problem. But like I, I mentioned, environmentalism before. I think this is something that a lot of people don't even think about as being religious in nature, but it is. I mean, there are obviously corporate interests in in skirting environmental regulations. If if instead of you know very careful containment and cleanup of of dangerous chemicals that are bad for the environment, you can just dump them in a river. Yeah, you're going to save money at the expense of other people and expense of the habitat of local animals and the expense of the future and blah, blah, blah. There, there is a profit-centered reason to, to not care about the environment. I acknowledge that. But the reason oh. we don't have tighter regulations is not just because of money. It's because, this is one example, the chair of the Senate subcommittee that is in charge of environmental regulation <laughs> is a hardcore evangelical Christian who is a young earth creationist in 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 public record statements to the Senate who believes that God will not allow the earth to become uninhabitable to humans because God made earth for humans and and that's not when we can't that we can't make the earth uninhabitable that's well, what that, he sounds, thinks. that sounds like James Einhoff to me I don't remember the guy's name but it's just ridiculous he this the guy that I'm thinking of uh brought a snowball into the Senate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as an example of how global warming is false or climate change is false. And he, he brought it in to say, look, if, if the earth were getting warmer, why is there a snowball in, I don't remember what month it was, you know, May or whatever, but and, um, it was unseasonably cold. And he brought in a snowball to show off that this is fake. And it's like, dude, <laughs> weather and climate are not synonyms like you're <laughs> fucking head of the environmental subcommittee are you serious and yeah, that's the difference between a, a millimeter and a kilometer right it, it's oh my gosh <laughs> like i i i was speechless when i heard that that like i was like this is your job and, and you're killing literally killing all of us with your incompetence um i don't know how people like that get elected it just blows. I mean, I do. It's because they have religious congregants and because they run on shit like abortion, but like, and sell out uh, to big corporations. Yeah. Yeah, cool. exactly. And that too. Yeah. I mean, this is the, you know, when you look at the donor list of these people, it's, it's, it's like NASCAR. I mean, you know, it's, it's all these, I mean, <laughs> they don't even try to hide it. Oh man. I hate saying things United. That was a really stupid decision. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. $1 an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. 
but yeah, I mean, all of these issues, and I'm actually, I'm, you know, I'm going to make an announcement on your show because uh, I haven't talked about this publicly yet, but I'm actually starting a book. Um, I haven't talked to a publisher or anything yet. That's, I'm just working on the outline right now, but I'm working on a book. Uh, basically, the concept of it is connecting the dots on all of these different issues that are very important and showing how religion is the reason that we're having all of these problems, even though they are diverse topics, such as the environment, such as sex ed, such as abortion, such as, I mean, there's obvious ones like LGBTQ rights. Clearly the conflict there is abortion. Or is, is, <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah. Abortion is, is clearly, I mean, the reason there we have an issue with that. Um, and, and I'm in the book, I'm going to be talking about, um, the fact that it's not exclusively that there are secular pro-life people. There is an argument. It's a wrong argument, but it exists. <laughs> we talk about it. Um, there is, there, there are anti-gay atheists and we need to talk about that too, because I mean, that, that is proof that this is not born in religion, even though religion is the reason it's a political problem and a legal rights issue. Um, that that's you know being homophobic is is not exclusively the domain of the religious. It is a human feeling uh, that some people have, regardless of their religion. The problem is with religion, as far as how that relates. Uh, religion codifies it and gives you a a First Amendment excuse for being bigoted about it and denying people equal access and rights on that basis, and that's not okay. In, I, in that. yeah, I think totally, there's. But- just just because you're an atheist doesn't mean that you're a skeptic or you know, right. welcoming of right. everybody. Mm-hmm. And there, there's there's also the issue of just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you've gotten rid of all your religious bullshit. Right. Oh, yeah. There's and, uh, yeah. Dale Ray actually does an excellent job. Do you, you guys know Dale Ray? I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep, yeah. We've had him on the show. Sex and God. Sex and God. Oh. Dale Ray does a great job of talking about this, although he's he's doing it from the approach of of sexuality, but it's the same exact argument where he talks about there's this this. Christian culture that we live in. And even if you're an atheist, you still sometimes fall into these traps of Christian approaches to, to sex and monogamy and shame about certain activities, uh, you know, because that's what we all grow up with and we all see and deal with every day, regardless of what you believe about it. Um, mm-hmm. there, there are so many people who, like, even if they're atheists, won't talk about, like, I mean, most people masturbate very often you know? vigorously I mean, yes well, yeah. it's it's a it's a daily or near daily part of virtually every person's life but no one ever talks about it publicly unless they're like being edgy like you know i mean really? we post instagram pictures of our meals that's a daily normal thing but but you would i mean you would get your account suspended if you posted instagram pictures of yourself masturbating it's against the terms <laughs> of the <laughs> They're both normal bodily, every like literally everyday things for many, many people, almost everyone. And there's no reason to be ashamed of one and proud or or interested in the other, except for this Christian idea, this puritanical Christian idea that food is okay, masturbation is oh my God, you can't know. You know, that's that's not that there's no reason for that. It's because we have these leftover ideas from Christian influence on our culture that, that that's wrong. It isn't, it isn't wrong. And if you're an atheist and you don't believe that masturbation is wrong, you should have no problem openly talking about it. But the issue is of course, other people still have those things. If, you know, like if you're, if you're between jobs or something, you know, and, and your future employers are going to check your Facebook, they're going to check your Twitter feed. And you know, you don't want them seeing that necessarily. It depends on, you know, what field you're in, but, there is a stigma about that kind of thing. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think atheists also should be focusing on. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because, yes, we want to make progress, but we also, in talking about those kinds of things, we kind of give ammunition to conservatives because they, they think of us as sexual deviants. They think of us as perverts. And by talking openly about things like masturbation, they're like, see, I told you, you know, those people are disgusting. And, that's something that we need to work on and fight. And I'm not just talking about sex stuff, although Daryl Ray does a great job of talking about that. If you haven't read Sex and God by Daryl Ray, by the way, people listening, uh, please go read that book because it's amazing. Um, but, I mean, this, this is also true about all sorts of other things that we are, are hesitant or afraid to talk about because of stigmas associated with them. 
um, because of Christian influence. Uh, no, nobody should be this. I want to, I want to make clear. I'm not talking about censorship. Censorship is something else, but nobody should openly talk about the fact that, or, or their, their, excuse me, their belief that climate change is not real without getting ridiculed to oblivion or, or connected at least. Yeah. And yeah, that's not a free speech issue. That's just the consequences of being an idiot online. But like, I, I, we really need to address this issue of like being afraid to talk to your parents about the fact that you're an atheist, being afraid to stand up to your boss for being sexist or racist. Like it's, these things are not okay. And it's important to talk about them and they're not going to improve unless we talk about them. And mm-hmm. especially for things that are related to religion uh, and religion's influence on politics, um, atheists need to stand up. And, and some, some of us do a great job of this, but a lot of us, frankly, are afraid to because there is a stigma associated with atheism. And um, it's something that needs work. And that's why I do what I do is to, to try to help people understand that, there's nothing wrong with being an atheist. There's nothing shameful about, about placing value on evidence and truth and critical thinking. I mean, like what a crazy thought, right? You know? um, but, it, but it is, it is uh, an issue for a lot of people that they'd rather not rock the boat than call people out on saying untrue things. And this is why we have, you know, in Texas, uh, school boards approving textbooks that say Moses was a founding father. What the fuck? <laughs> like, are you? How did this happen? I mean, like, this is this is not supposed to happen in 2015, uh, yeah. but it is happening, and it's it's because um, we're not stopping it. And the, that didn't the, even come up in my Adventist education. Mm-hmm. I was going it, to church schools. Yeah, it's just it's totally insane, um, and I, I'm not uh, I'm not trying to equate religiosity and mental illness and that's i'm it's colloquial but uh <laughs> but yeah i mean it, it's it is nuts that we have gotten to this point where we have to fight these kinds of fights and it used to be because we were an insignificant minority and we had no political power and we had no voice and yeah. that's changing we are now uh a fifth of the population are non-religious people and uh, and that's growing all the time. Um, I mean, in 2005, 1% of the U.S. population, this is, uh, I think this was Gallup. I'm pretty sure this is from Gallup. 1% of the population openly identified using the word atheist. In 2012, nice. seven years later, 5% did. That's a five-fold increase in seven years. Now, of course, between 2005, 2012, we had the publication of the God delusion. We had the publication of the end of faith. We had the publication of breaking the spell. We had the publication of um, God is not great. We had the election season of 2008 where uh, in his inauguration, Obama talked about um, agnostics and atheists for the first time. We had uh, the reason rally was in that, in that time span. Uh, I mean, a lot of things have happened in just a short time to bring a lot of awareness to this. I would say Uh, the biggest is the proliferation of social networks, blogs, mm -hmm. and podcasts. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, information is, is what's changing the game here. I mean, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, if you had a, you know, a seven year old who had questions about Jesus, they had a couple of options. They could ask their parents, they could ask their teacher at school. They could ask their pastor, or they could go to the library and look up a book. And I mean, seven-year-olds are not going to do that. They're just not. Uh, if you have religious parents and you ask your parents, you're just going to get the same answers if you ask your pastor. So that's no good. Um, public school teachers, uh, for some some good and some bad reasons, but are generally reticent to get too much into those types of things. Religious ones yeah. will be happy to give you their their all of their shit, but the ones yeah. that are you know either secular or atheist or both, you know, they'd be afraid to say a, a damn thing. And and even and to their credit, many religious teachers also understand that they're not supposed to talk about that kind of stuff from a preachy point of view. Um, but they're not going to tell you, well, that's I mean, you know, that's Christian mythology. That's not actually true. You know, if, <laughs> if that's not what they believe. Um, 
even though that that's the fact of it. But now, I mean, this is this that's not how this works anymore. I mean, I I had uh, last year, uh, I think this was last November. Yes, uh, I was I was visiting Missouri for my grandmother's birthday, and when she turned a hundred, and a whole bunch of family had come in from all over the country. Um, and, uh, there was a, a baby, um, Claire is her name and she's a couple years old. And I saw her playing with a magazine that she, I don't know, someone gave her, but this is, I'm going to just going to show you what happened with the book because I want you to see this. So you, this is a podcast, so you guys won't be able to tell, but she was holding the magazine and going like this and touching it. And I think most people would not have put together what was going on, but I knew what was happening because I had seen her playing with an iPad right before that. And she was trying to understand why she couldn't change the picture on the magazine. Because nice. it was an iPad. And it didn't compute to her that it wasn't electronic. This is, I mean, this is the next generation of people that this is how deeply embedded information and computers are going to be in their lives. Um, mm. A seven-year-old now, if they have questions about Jesus, and their parents tell them that, you know, all, all this nonsense about what Christians believe, that, that he was born to a virgin, that he died and rose again three days later and, you know, died to, for our sins and blah, blah, blah. They're going to get on Wikipedia on their iPhone right then and there and look it up and say, that's bullshit. That's not true at all. It says right <laughs> here, you know, yeah. you can't lie to people like that anymore. And Ignorance and lies are the entire basis of how religion as a meme protects itself and spreads. And the fact is the internet is making that no longer possible. And I think that's why we're seeing such huge numbers of non-religious people and atheists among young people. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just such a clear generational divide. If you look at the demographics of this stuff, um, the younger you get, the more atheist people become. And, that's that doesn't seem to be reversing and it seems to be growing. And I think that it's really just a matter of time before it's not just that 20% of the population is not religious, but you know, it with birth rates being what they are and with older people dying off, it's going to be a, a lot of people soon who understand critical thinking, who understand that this is all crap. And like we were talking about before, Atheist doesn't mean good at critical thinking. It doesn't mean, uh, and non-religious does not mean atheist either. I mean, that 20% are not atheists. They're just people who don't follow religion. And it's a, it's a small percentage, but some of those people, uh, I, would even, I would even question whether they're not religious. Um, for example, a friend of mine, um, she insists she is not Christian. She insists she is not religious, but she believes that Jesus is the son of God. She believes in God. She believes that Jesus died for her sins. She believes that by believing that Jesus died for her sins, she will go to heaven and not to hell. And I'm like, dude, you're a Christian. I mean, that's what that is. But she yeah. says Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm like, dude, you're a fucking Christian. I'm sorry, but that's what that is. That's, that's you as just told me you're a Christian. That's um, as crazy yeah. as Jews for Jesus. Yeah. But she identifies as non-religious, and it's just like you're poisoning the sample. I'm sorry, but yep. <laughs> you are Christian. But yeah, I mean, there's there's not a huge number of people who approach it that way. But yeah, we have to be careful when we're we're throwing out our numbers. Twenty percent, it's more than twenty, but um, that was a 2014 number. Uh, but yeah, twenty percent. Actually, I think it was twenty two percent in 2014. Anyway, yeah, that sounds about right. A, a fifth to a quarter of Americans are not religious. Not that many are atheists. Um, the last number that I saw about atheists now, again, stigma. So when you're talking about atheism, you're going to get a different number based on how you ask the question. If you say, are you an atheist? Yes, no. If you ask that that way, you're going to get a much lower number than if you ask the question, do you have an active belief in the existence of at least one God? Yes or no. If you ask it that way, 12% of Americans, according to Harris Poll. 12% of Americans say, no, I do not believe in a God or higher power. Uh, I think the actual exact wording was, do you believe in a capital G God or higher power, lowercase HP? Um, yes or no. It was a yes, no question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously some percentage refused to answer, but 12% uh, said no. Those are atheists. Yep. Um, yeah. But only, I think, I, it was a different source. I think it was Pew Forum. 
they asked a very similar question, uh, except they used the A word. Um, they said, and if I remember this accurately, they said an atheist is someone who lacks belief in a God or higher power. Are you an atheist? And when they ask it that way, 7% said that they are. So that 5% gap and 5%, that's one in 20 people. That's a mm-hmm. huge number of people. Um, uh, 20, uh, one in five over 18 in the U S um, but, or excuse me, one in 20, 5%, one in 20 people, are atheists, but don't use the word atheist. And that's the stigma. That's because when you call yourself an atheist in this country, there's this idea that you're angry. There's this idea that you are anti-religion, that uh, that you were somehow hurt by religion, that you are antisocial, that you are sexually deviant. There's all these, you know, or, or demonic even, like there's all of these things that that are communicated alongside the A word, um, well, there's even and, just the simple that you know for certain that there is no God. Right. And that's another one. That's that's just a, a misconception about the definition. And that's why it's important on these polling things. And, the, you know, these these polling companies, you know, Pew Forum and Gallup and and uh, Harris Poll and uh, Bill Keller Ministries and all these all these organizations that do scientific polling, um, they spend huge amounts of time and effort and money on focus groups and on discussions and meetings, working out the exact wording for these questions, because they know that when you open it up to tens of thousands of people, you're going to get all sorts of different interpretations of what you're trying to ask. Um, oh, yeah. And when you know you ask somebody, are you an atheist? Yes, you know, um, a large number of them are going to say, I don't know for sure God doesn't exist. So I can't say that even though I don't believe it. And it's like, I would say, go ahead and mark you're an atheist because that's not what atheism is. But unless you you literally define it in the question, um, you're going to get a, a large percentage of people, maybe not a majority, but a, a chunk who who misunderstand what you're actually saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you know that's that's just a problem in any kind of polling, and that's just something you have to live with. But um, yeah, I mean that's that's frankly a PR issue for atheists. That's something that we need to work on is helping people understand what the definition of atheist is, uh, helping people understand that it is not, it is not shameful to be an atheist, helping people understand that it is not bad to be angry is an atheist. There's this idea that we, sh- that we shouldn't be angry, that we're happy people, that we're humanists, that uh, we're just like everybody else. And that this is a myth or a uh, misconception about atheists that were angry. I'm hella angry. I mean, <laughs> I'm a happy person. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I see people getting kicked out of their houses or getting their college tuition cut off or getting divorced and losing custody of their kids or, you know, getting beaten up at school because they're atheists. Uh, yeah, I'm fucking angry. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I'm not angry ab- about God. I'm angry about Christians mistreating atheists and demonizing us uh, because of insecurities about what they believe or as a defense mechanism of their religion. Uh, It's not, it's, I mean, you know, and this isn't news to any atheist, but it's not about it's, I don't hate God. I don't believe in God. It's, it's, and it's the same with the devil. I don't love the devil. I don't believe in the devil. It's nonsense. Um, But it does cause actual problems for real living people it causes suffering to have to deal with this kind of stuff. And yeah, that makes me angry. That's, that's my motivation for being an activist is to improve this situation. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's it's a PR issue. It's, it's something to work on in in our public perception. Yeah. I I always tell people to come out whenever possible, but about the only time I I say, don't tell anybody is like, if your parents are paying for your college schooling and you know you're not sure how they're going to react like don't say a damn thing wait until you're out of school yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's the concept of uh it's called dropping bobbies that's kind of a, a little bit of an archaic term for it but uh it, it comes from the gay community the gay mindset of um you know dropping a bobby pin and seeing how they react to that so uh dropping bobbies means like hinting at something or, or talking about something similar to see how someone reacts and kind of feel them out on it. Like for example, if you're not sure if you should come out to somebody as gay, you can ask them, um, you know, if they've ever seen Brokeback Mountain and what they think about that movie. And that's kind of a safe way to, uh, to find out if they're like, you know, fucking homo, like 
faggots and st- you know, they start talking like that and don't come out to them. But, <laughs> you know, but if they, if they say that it was a love story and that it was really brave of those actors to do it before it was as widely as accepted as it is now. And that, you know, blah, 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 then yeah, it, you're probably fine coming out to them. And I've heard a surprising number of stories of atheists who were afraid to come out to their parents doing so and having one of their parents or both of their parents say, well, you know, we don't really believe this either, but it's important to, you, you know, our, our parents, your grandparents. And so we just, we decided to go along with it. And it's like, <laughs> that's, that's the best thing ever. Right. When, yeah. when you find out, or, or, you know, I've, I've heard plenty of stories about this where one parent is religious and one parent isn't. And, somehow that means that we're going to raise the kids religious, like just because, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, yeah. The boy's going to get circumcised because, right, we're, right. because, yeah. and, and this, this happens a lot. Um, it's just, it's a demographic fact. I'm not making a judgment, but it is a demographic fact that women are more religious than men. And it's important to a lot of mothers that their children are raised in a religious setting or that they go to church for socialization reasons <laughs> for, um, it's, Moral, it's a great support network. Yeah, it's and, and mm, that's arguable, but mm-hmm. I understand the argument. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's it. There's a reason that people do it for for social um, inclusiveness and for um, y- you know for the free daycare that comes with it. If you want to get out of the house for a little while, mm-hmm. and uh, and and a lot of these church services these days. Uh, I mean, in, in my experience as, as a musician working at some of these, is they're really they're, they're fun. I mean, they're, they're concerts. They're basically free mm-hmm. concerts. A lot of them serve food. A lot of them serve coffee. And, uh, you know, they, they ask you to give money, but you don't have to. And it's basically just a couple of hours of listening to quote unquote, you know, good moral teachings, although that's not true either, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I can understand the appeal. I do. It's, it's free music. It's, it's free daycare. It's time away with your spouse, uh, going to a concert together. And, and I, I totally understand why, especially if you've moved to a new city or, or just, you know, are feeling depressed about something or, or feeling uh, in a rut or that your life has as little purpose that you would want that kind of encouraging reinforcement that there's something bigger and, and, you know, you get to see your friends and um, in some situations, people like showing off to their friends if they've yeah. That's like you, you, you wear your Sunday best, right? You know, that's, that's important to some people to, to have a chance to dress up like that. If you don't normally get a chance to do that kind of thing. A giant prosperity gospel. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of non-religious social cultural reasons to be part of a church. Um, and that's something that atheists are working on actively, which I'm happy to see. Uh, I, it's not for everybody. And a lot of atheists, despise that type of thing and that's fine you don't have to go but for some atheists uh being part of a a church type group even though it's not religious in nature is important we're social animals we thrive in social settings we we do not do well when we're lonely humans just don't we're we're not we're not evolved and adapted to live on our own like that some animals are i mean you know cats wild cats mm-hmm. Totally fine living on their own. I mean, when they're kittens, they socialize with other cats. When they're mating, they socialize with other cats. The rest of the time, they hunt and sleep, and that's it. And they, they live independently. Humans don't do that. Humans are like like elephants or lions or fish or or birds or any other species that is cooperative. And that's that's how we do best is in a group. And yeah, well, not everybody wants to be part of the standard you know, a drink a beer style meetup atheist group. Some yeah. people really like, like the new style of uh, Sunday assembly that's being brought sure. out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and I've spoken at a couple of those things and you know, it's, it's like I said, it's not for everybody, but don't trash people who get something out of it. I think there's, if, if it's useful to you, if it helps you feel better, if it, if it serves some purpose for you, uh, fine, whatever, knock yourself out, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, uh, especially because of that transitionary period when people are questioning religion. Um, and especially if they're, if, I mean, that can, that can really upend someone's life. If they, they're coming out of a religious household or, or community and they feel like no one is on their side. If, you know, they're, they're get kicked out of their church, they're, they're losing their family. 
they don't feel like they have anyone they can talk to because, uh, you know, I mean, normally the people that you would talk to if you're religious and you're having some kind of problem are your pastor, your spouse. Um, you know, if, if you are losing your religion, you can't talk to those people about that stuff if they're religious. It's, it's, that's not the right environment and the right, the right person to give you advice. And that's where we need to be is, as atheists who have been through this. We need to be able to step up and have a ready community of people who can help uh, through that extremely difficult time. And I'm not necessarily just talking about like counselors. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm not just going the conversation. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's something that's really difficult for a lot of, of new atheists is that they're simultaneously just realizing that they have anger about religion, about being scammed, about uh, the damage that religion does to people as far as their individual lives and to society and to politics. Um, but at the same time, they need lots of moral support because they're going through this really tough time. And atheist groups, small groups, local groups, affiliates, um, you know, American Atheists has local affiliate groups. They have 150 of them. Yeah. The Secular Student Alliance has about 400 groups like that. There are many of these all over the country at colleges and, and off campus. Um, and if you're new to atheism, uh, I, that's the first thing I tell somebody is go join a local group. I mean, yeah, there's a million great books that you should read. There's a million YouTube channels that you should watch. There's a million podcasts that you should listen to. But mm -hmm. a local group is the first thing that you should do because oh, they can guide you through this whole process and they can help you realize, first of all, that you're not alone, even if you, if you technically know that. But they can help with help, help with you feeling like you're not alone. And that's a really important thing for social animals like us. Um, and extremely it, important and yeah. also find, finding local resources mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and especially if you depended on that kind of thing uh i mean churches take care of their own a lot of the time as far as uh you know charitable type of things as far as um uh i mean they they get their resources from you too so it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not being charitable it's just redistribution among the group but um you know after they shave a little off the top of course but mm -hmm. uh but I mean, if you're, if you are accustomed to, you know, two hours every week of, of having a, a couple of hours away from your kids where, you know, that they're in, they're being watched and, and entertained while you get to listen to some music and spend some time with your girlfriend or your spouse or whatever. Um, and you suddenly don't believe that anymore and you're not welcome there anymore. Um, I think it's important for us to have something to offer, uh, people who, who want that and need that, um, I personally go to a local group, uh, Columbia Atheists here in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, it's an American Atheists affiliate. They're great people. We usually just meet at a bar and drink and talk and have dinner. Um, but uh, we do some other stuff too. We do blood drives and we do litter cleanup and, you know, um, food distribution stuff. And we do, uh, we do talks and lectures. We, you know, we bring in uh, the, the university of Missouri is here. It's a, like I said, a college town. So we, we bring in people to speak, um, and we sponsor certain things. Uh, and, you know, there, there's lots of stuff you can do. But um, this is actually, I talked about this in, in the group running guide that I helped write for the Secular Student Alliance, that the most successful groups have lots of activities going on that are different from each other. Because not everybody wants a bar type group. And not everybody wants a Sunday assembly type group. And not everybody wants a book club. Um, and not everybody wants... A, uh, you know, a litter cleanup. I mean, personally, litter, I, I care a lot about the environment. I'm a vegetarian for environmental reasons, also animal welfare reasons. But um, I mean, the environment is important to me, but I have very little interest in spending two hours of my time cleaning up litter. That's just, that's not something that, that I join an atheist group to do personally. I, I appreciate that people do that, but I would rather do something else. I would rather do a book club or meet at a bar. And uh, if you offer, you know, five different types of meetings, you're going to reach five times as many people as if you only have one type of meeting. Mm -hmm. And the key to this, I think, the, the most successful groups that, that do these kinds of things have different people who lead different types of activities. And it's all under the banner of the local group. Um, it's it's uh, it's unreasonable to expect one group leader to spend the amount of time necessary to lead five different functions like that every week or, or on alternating weeks or whatever. Um, and all, it's not just the time commitment, but it's also what you're interested in. Um, 
But if you can find enough people who are interested in, uh, you know, doing a litter cleanup and you can find one person who cares enough about that as a way to connect with other atheists to coordinate it and organize it, then you can add that to your calendar of stuff that your group does and make your group appealing to people who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's something that I'm really interested in is, is helping make atheist communities stronger and more appealing to people because, uh, I mean, you, you see all these articles about, you know, churches getting shut down or, or going up for sale and don't get me wrong. I am very happy about that. Um, <laughs> You know, I was in New York City recently, and I passed by this church that had been turned into a shoe store, and it was like, <laughs> so fucking awesome. I took a picture of it. It made me happy um, <laughs> that there's, there's falling demand for churches to the point that shoe stores are buying them and, and using them for other purposes. There's a couple uh, in Portland that are bars. Yeah, yeah. And that's really cool. <laughs> but But what does concern me is that people might be missing stuff that the churches did provide, not the religious crap. But the rest of it, because we're people and we like that kind of thing. That's why we did it. That's why that's why people continue to go to church, even though they know the scientific stuff is wrong. Um, David, uh, what's his name? Wolf, W-O-L-F-F, I believe. He wrote a wonderful textbook called Introduction to the Psychology of Religion, I believe is the name of it. Mm. Anyway, he talks about the two different reasons that religion continues to exist despite the fact that uh, we have, uh, excuse me, he talks about the two different reasons that religion exists. And the one of those two reasons is the reason, the reason that people still are involved in religion, despite the enlightenment. So the two reasons that religion exists is to explain the unexplained. You have lightning, you have thunder, you have flooding, you have um, constellations, you have, uh, people dying of appendicitis before we knew what appendicitis was. You have uh, infant mortality, you have maternal mortality, you have, uh, you know, epidemics. I mean, all sorts of things that are scary and that, that seem random. And um, I mean, you know, imagine this is 10,000 years ago and, and the beginning of the Neolithic and you've got a 30 year old guy in the prime of his life, healthy, strong, a father, and suddenly he has a horrible debilitating pain out of nowhere. And two days later, he's dead. And you're like, what did he do to piss off what God, you know? <laughs> and I mean, if you don't know what a burst appendix is, that's a reasonable assumption that he did something wrong and is being punished for it. I mean, it's, it's not accurate, but I can understand why people would think that. Um, but, you know, now we know better. We know what that is and we know what causes it. We know that it's life threatening and we know that it's extremely urgent and we can fix it. And the question then is now that we know that, why do we pray about people with appendicitis? And, uh, and he answers that question in this book. He talks about aside from answering unanswered questions, which is one thing that religion does. The other thing that religion does is provide social cohesion and inclusiveness and uh, community for religious people and ritual and rites of passage and other things that are important to humans as part of our culture. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we take away religion uh, because we don't need it anymore, because we have science to explain the unexplained, that only resolves half the reason that religion exists. The other reason that religion exists and the people and the reason that people you know, if, if say you've got some guy who's, you know, he's got two kids and his wife is religious, but he doesn't give a shit. Uh, but he goes to church with his wife and his kids every week. It's not because he's religious. It's because he wants to maintain his marriage. It's because his wife thinks it's important that their kids get a moral upbringing. And we have to be able to address those kinds of questions if we want to make this a long-term thing. Um, what is he getting out of it? Well, he's getting cohesion. He's getting a happy wife. Um, because that's what she wants and she wants a, a moral lessons for her kids and, and they listen to music together and blah, blah, blah. None of that has to do with religion. And we can provide all of that stuff if we put effort into it and it's important to us and it's a priority that we decide to put our resources into. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think this is something that's underappreciated by atheists is, uh, is the second reason that religions exist. And that's uh, it's, we, we spend a lot of time and attention and effort and conference talks and books and videos talking about the scientific reasons that religion is wrong. We all know. We, we know. 
I mean, yes, it's, it's, I am fascinated by this stuff. I love astronomy. Don't get me wrong. I have a portrait of Carl Sagan that I commissioned. Um, it's, that's not what I'm saying. I love science, but we should, I think it's, it's my opinion as an atheist activist that we need to spend less attention, time, effort, resources, talking about the scientific reasons that religion is wrong, talking about science and more time talking about culture and things that are important to people. Uh, and the, and in my opinion, the real reasons in the last 200 years since the enlightenment that society has continued to tolerate church. The, the reasons that church has not been viewed socially as, as a terrible influence on society as obsolete as a scam. I think it's because it provides these other things that people want. And I mean, it's clearly a scam. It's clearly scientifically inaccurate. Why is mm -hmm. it still here? Because it provides something people want. Um, and they don't have religions. I mean, do not have the, ex the ex exclusive uh, hold on that. That is something that we can provide. And I think there are millions and millions of people who currently attend church who don't believe it, but want those things. And we can, we can help them leave if we provide what they want. Uh, just yeah. supply and demand type of thing. Agreed. Uh, now, unfortunately we are at an hour and 20 minutes okay. and there is virtually nothing to cut up to this point. <laughs> I pretty well agree. So uh, what things do you have to pimp? Um, I just launched a brand new Facebook page as a freelance activist and public speaker. If you go on Facebook and you just search for Danielle Moscato, uh, you'll find my personal profile and my page. Uh, please like my page. Uh, I just launched a brand new website as part of that same uh, branding thing uh, at daniellemoscato.com. Um, I am available to give talks. Uh, on my next talk is at the Seco Student Alliance National Headquarters uh, in Columbus, Ohio, on July 10th. Um, I love speaking for groups. I love speaking for local groups. I love speaking for conferences. I also debate. Um, I would love to come speak for your group. I have excellent rates for atheist groups, especially if you're a nonprofit. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, please connect with me. I love hearing from people. I love meeting people. Um, and uh, yeah, Daniel Moscato on Facebook and Twitter and um Thanks very much for having me on. Awesome. Thank you. Seriously, Thanks. badass. All right. For our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541 2030666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.